Uh, good morning, listeners. Welcome to today's uh, discussion, a presentation uh, which is more like a continuation from our model of uh, yesterday. My name is Matthias Ayeye, and uh, yesterday we started with looking at um, cultural heritage impact assessments, discussing about the introduction and uh, some of the laws and policies that guides cultural heritage impact assessments. Uh, for today, we will be looking at uh, guidelines on cultural heritage impact assessments. Uh, we will be looking more into the ways, uh, some of the procedures that are uh, embedded in uh, ensuring uh, cultural heritage, uh, the impacts are properly and duly assessed. Uh, before we go into our main discussion for today, uh, cultural heritage management presently is going through a process of change where the focus is no longer uh, the management of the integrity of uh, heritage assets, but the cultural significances they convey. Uh, when we say these cultural significances, we, 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 we're talking about things like uh, the values and attributes, either tangible or intangible, which uh, uh, motivates this, uh, this uh, assets, this heritage assets. Uh, cultural heritage if we look at it, it's, uh, it's a record of human relationship to the, world, uh, to the world's past achievement and uh, discoveries. Now, much of this heritage, especially in developing countries, is now undergoing uh, threats, uh, partly as a result of uh, modernization and development, and uh, the rate of loss is, is really increasing. Now, if archaeological and historical sites and uh, structures are allowed to disappear, important testaments to society's creativity and uh, the knowledge base for, for shaping the future, uh, for, for the future, the, the, the future generation getting to know their past will be lost. Uh, uh, fortunately, or will I say unfortunately, they, they, or let's say fortunately, although the loss of heritage is irreversible, but it is often avoidable. And uh, effective protection is based both on an understanding of the issues concerning this cultural heritage and appropriate assessment and action to, to minimize damages that will be caused to, to, to this heritage, this asset. Now, uh, at times, cultural heritage can be, can be called uh, uh, cultural properties. Uh, cultural resources, uh, but many at times it's, it is defined, like I said, as the present manifestation of, of the human past, where we refer to sites, to structures, to, to remains of archaeological, historical, religious, cultural, or aesthetic values. Now, uh, project development now, uh, when we talk about modernization, especially in developing countries, when improperly designed, uh, can cause serious damage, severe damage to cultural heritage and diminishes value through uh, activities of um, um, this development. Now, no minding the kind of development, uh, uh, if, you, if you have to go through unregulated uh, building activities, uh, conversion or degradation of habitats, environmental pollution or disruption of traditional ways of life, these uh, are improper ways, improper designs or improper actions that can diminish or create a distortion to cultural heritage. Now, because impact can occur through uh, a destruction of these sites, either, either during or after projects, uh, Physical changes uh, 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 and all vigilance is required now in all the phases of the project preparation. And the reason why we are talking about the guidelines with which this uh, assessment can be duly uh, taken. Now, we can define 
cultural impact assessment, or we can simply say cultural heritage impact assessment, uh, following our discussion of yesterday, as a method of analyzing what impact a development policy or action may have on the cultural aspect of the environment. Now, when we say cultural aspect, this aspect includes, but are not limited to, to the following we have in our slide here today. Uh, the ways people cope with life through their economy, uh, rural system and values, which is more like uh, intangible, the intangible form of uh, uh, culture, or the ways people use the natural environment for their shelter, uh, uh, making livelihood, industry, worship, recreation, gathering together, uh, when we talk about shelter, we see uh, go to some of these rural communities. We see where raffia palms and other forms of plants are used in, um, in in making shelter. Now, the ways communities are organized and held together by their social and cultural beliefs and institutions, uh, as it varies uh, from from um, culture to culture, from place to place. Uh, also, looking at ways of life that communities value as expression of their identity. Now, uh, taking Nigeria, for example, we have the North, the South, the East and the West, uh, though the country divided into six geopolitical zones. Now these zones are made up of a lot of ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic groups. Now there are ways of life of these communities. Now, one of the aspects, of, again, we're looking at it's um, the acts, the music, the dance, the language, the crafts, the drama, the festivals, and uh, other expressive form of, uh, of culture that are embedded in these communities. Now, uh, also looking at the value and belief system about our proper ways to live, uh, family and extra family relationship, as it differs from place to place. And also, this aspect covers uh, the aesthetic and cultural character of a community or, or uh, a neighborhood. Now, when we say cultural impact assessment, uh, in a nutshell, it, it clearly involves uh, characterizing the existing states of uh, such aspects of the environment. It also uh, uh, talks about forecasting how they may change if a given project or alternative is implemented and also uh, talk about uh, developing means of mitigating changes that are likely to be adverse from the point of view of an affected population. Now, having all these in mind, uh, it's important for us to now go into uh, a conceptual model for collecting and examining data on uh, cultural impact. Now, um, the basic uh, model uh, we are presenting here is inspired by uh, similar models used for environmental and social impact assessment, although with differences in some of the key elements and their applications. Now, the model provides the framework for collecting and examining data on cultural impacts of development, policies, and action. Now, this principle, its principal element uh, clearly involves uh, determining the type of project or action for the assessment. Now, understanding or identifying the cultural variables to be impacted upon, uh, determining the stage in policy formulation or project circle for which the impact is being assessed and bringing this three mentioned principle uh, into a matrix uh, to facilitate the investigation and assessment of this uh, uh, significant impact. Now, taking a look at, at these principles, uh, we take the first one, which is determining uh, project type. Now, cultural impact will vary according to the type of development, according to the type of project that is uh, to be implemented. Now, the range and variety of project types includes the following for which cultural impact assessment will normally involve uh, a detailed technical description 
of the proposed development. Uh, pro project types uh, vary from, from, from mineral extraction to uh, uh, hazard or sanitary waste sites to power plants to reservoirs. And when we say reservoirs, uh, it includes all water impoundment for flood control, hydropower, conservation and recreation, cooling lakes, uh, diversion structures, uh, industrial plants and housing uh, facilities. Uh, it also looks at uh, uh, maybe land use this designation, uh, government installation, educational, even transportation facilities. These are diverse forms of uh, projects that, uh, are, are, are being, uh, that are to be considered. Now, the next on this principle is identifying the variables of this cultural impact assessment of the CIA. Now, when we say variables, this points to measurable and qualitative changes in the cultural life, institution, resources, and infrastructure of human population and community, uh, resulting from, from a, a developmental project or policy change. Uh, on the basis of this, uh, of this, uh, on the basis of this examination of this uh, impact assessment, we, we are able to provide some, some tentative, some some tentative lists of um, cultural variables under uh, these three uh, general headings. Uh, looking at cultural life, when we say cultural life. What, what do we really mean by cultural life? We, we're talking about, uh, uh, say, verbal expressions. Uh, when we say verbal expressions, we mean stories, uh, poetry, languages, uh, uh, or, or musical expression like songs, uh, music, or action, expression of action, which is a form of a cultural life like dance, uh, like plays, ritual, or we, we talk about tangible expressions like paintings, like sculptures, like poetries, like a, a, a woodwork, handcrafts. Also, we can also look at uh, uh, ceremonies, uh, cultural beliefs, practices and value system. These make up the cultural life of, uh, of a particular uh, uh, culture. Now, the second variable that uh, this has been categorized into the variable has been categorized is cultural institution. And when we say cultural institution, uh, we will refer to some, some of uh, maybe the, looking at the, the political structure or, uh, or social uh, structure or form of organization. Uh, also the network looking at uh, the power relation and decision making structures of, uh, of of a community, so to say. Then the third is um, also looking at uh, cultural resources and infrastructure, where we, we, we look more at uh, the indigenous knowledge system, uh, where we talk about the wisdom skills capacity, uh, going further to look at um, the sacred sites, sacred groups, looking at uh, places of, um, of, of historic importance, uh, at times, uh, talking about cultural significance, including uh, monuments, historical sites, um, antiquities, yeah, antiquities, uh, looking at uh, their acts, uh, the, the kind of theater, the kind of drama that they, they, they have, and also uh, uh, looking at uh, 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 many at times the, the, the traditional architecture that is embedded in, in, in such system. Now, uh, going further, the concept, the, the third to be looked at is determining the stage in policy development or project circle. Now, all projects go through a series of stages or steps, starting with uh, uh, the planning and uh, policy developmental stage. Uh, all forms of project go through this stage, the, the first phase, which is planning and development. Uh, this, this stage actually refers to all activity that takes place from the conceptualization of a project or policy to, to the point of, uh, of construction. Now, all, all re-impact are assumed at this stage, and um, it's important that this is, is, is noted. Now, the second stage is the construction or implementation stage. Uh, this is uh, actually the stage 
uh, that begins with a definitive decision, uh, where definitive decision is made to proceed with the project or policy, and uh, uh, permits are issued by law. Uh, this process, many times in most projects, it, it involves the, uh, the land clearing stage, the, the building construction stage, uh, like building of access road, the developing utilities, where actual displacement and dis uh, relocation of people was necessary. Now, uh, after this stage, we'll now look at uh, uh, the operation or maintenance stage. Uh, uh, this stage it actually comes to be after the uh, construction is completed uh, or the policy, so to say, is implemented. Now, uh, this stage actually involves the actual operation of such projects or pr during the operation maintenance uh, takes place. Now, after this stage, uh, the next stage that is looked at, uh, actually, this, this, this stage is reached when the proposal is made that the project or policy associated with all activities ceases to exist. So, uh, the, this stage of uh, uh, the commission or abandonment comes in. Now, this is a stage that uh, community anxieties are aroused again. During the policy and uh, planning stage, anxiety of the community are aroused. Then, coming to this stage again, uh, community anxiety uh, aroused again, where maybe this time around, uh, loss of amenities or facilities and privileges uh, comes in. Uh, at this point, community concerns will, will be the provision of alternatives or compensation for maybe loss of assets. Or, or, or benefits accruing to to the community as regards the uh, actual operation of uh, the, the the project. Now, the, the the fourth stage now, like I said earlier, is constructing a matrix for relating all the earlier variables discussed. Now, the cultural impact assessment specialist must now construct a matrix to to direct the uh, all investigation of potentially significant cultural impact. Now, for each project or policy stages, now we talked about the policy stages, uh, the various stages of the project to include the planning, the construction, the operation, and uh, the commissioning. Now, the assessor this time around should identify the potential impact on each of the cultural variables we had discussed on each of the cultural variables earlier discussed, and they must be identified in the matrix. Now, this ensures that no critical area are overlooked. Understanding these variables, knowing at the stages of the projects, project lifespan that these variables will be impacted upon, and ensuring that all impacts that will affect these variables are well documented is what uh, this whole discussion so far uh, sums up. Now, we're going straight into the guidelines for conducting uh, actual cultural impact assessment. Uh, these are just a, just a summary of, uh, of the guidelines. Like we earlier said, uh, there are no clear court uh, guidelines, but the guidelines developed uh, was modified from the general environmental and social impact assessment guidelines uh, that, that, that have been employed in ensuring that proper data and uh, assessment is done for the entire coverage of all space and all fair, all aspects of our particular project. Now, the first we are looking at here, the guideline, is uh, identifying and examining the policy, the legal and regulatory framework for protecting and managing cultural heritage. Now, if we have to tie this down to uh, what we just discussed earlier, this stage comes up during the, the, the planning, the planning stage. Uh, the, when, we, when we talked about uh, the, the planning or policy developmental stage. Now, uh, the, the, the framework for protecting and managing cultural heritage should, should be examined in the early part of the environmental assessment, that is in the preparatory uh, stage. Now, this at uh, this phase, uh, all adequate laws, procedures, uh, including the chance find as uh, instructed or as stipulated by uh, the World Bank uh, ESS-8 that talks about cultural heritage, and the institutional capacities that uh, are meant to guide the protection of cultural heritage. Now, all regulations that had to do with this had to be clearly looked at. Now, the, the, the environmental assessor should identify the gaps and weaknesses in these regulations 
and suggest how the project itself might help uh, protect especially threatened heritage through maybe a, a special or targeted measures like uh, designing um, uh, alterations or other special project components. And uh, actually at this point, look for ways to strengthen this, this, this capacity, this regulatory capacity uh, for effective um, application in the long term. Now, the, the, the second guideline, the second guideline for uh, we will be looking at is um, the development of an effective public involvement plan. Now, this is to involve all affected and interested parties. Uh, simply put, it, can, it, it is called a public consultation. Uh, this part is very important in that it requires identifying and working with all potentially affected group. Now, this particular aspect starts at the planning stage of the proposed project. Now, the, pub, the, 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 the level of public participation needed for a particular project varies with the nature of the project. Now, for a complicated project, it might be necessary to undertake uh, a participatory inquiry survey of the affected group and uh, end up complementing it with uh, maybe personal interviews. Uh, uh, to, to some extent, we will have uh, things we call the focus group discussion. Uh, of group representatives to determine the general character of the affected communities. Now, it also goes as far as defining the potentially affected group, where you have the vulnerable groups and the likes, uh, determine potential areas of concerns and impact, and uh, also determine enough about them and to know how to involve uh, these this individuals or groups. Now, the, the, the data and information obtained at this very uh, uh, stage of public consultation uh, assist in the development of a public involvement program which will be contained in um, the, the environmental management plan for cultural impact uh, because the, this particular phase of public consultation actually begins and goes throughout the life cycle of a project till the decommissioning. So uh, we will now look at maybe in a simpler project, uh, maybe merely consulting with local opinion leaders or local power group and experts may be sufficient to obtain the uh, critical data that is needed to help develop uh, the, the, the public involvement uh, uh, program. And like Elias said, uh, this part, this, this public consultation begins and ends with any project. Now, the, the, the third we'll be looking at is uh, the development uh, or develop a proposed action for the study. Uh, simply put, uh, uh, scoping, the uh, general EIA or Environmental Impact Assessment Term calls this step the EIA. Now, in this step, proposed action uh, is described in enough details uh, to begin. Uh, to identify the technical data requirement needed for, for, from, from the proponents, from the individuals, from the community, so as to come up with a proper impact assessment, a cultural impact assessment. And when we're looking at this scoping, uh, the following basic technical information and data might, might be considered. Uh, uh, data like uh, location of projects, uh, the land requirement that the land take of the project, uh, the need for, for, for ancillary facilities of the project, now the, the construction implementation schedule, the, the size of the workforce, uh, either during the construction and operation phase or throughout the phases of the project, uh, the facility size and the shape, uh, the, 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 the need for, for local uh, workforce, the, the kind of resources and all. Uh, this, this list actually also uh, covers, this, this scoping uh, in a nutshell actually also covers the variables we, we had earlier discussed. It's imperative so as to know the nature, the design, and the capacity of data gathering that will be expected to have a, a holistic assessment of, uh, of the culture uh, so as to uh, ascertain the exact impact that the project or proposed project or policy 
we have on the, the, the culture. Now, going further, the, the next uh, guideline is uh, the, the defining the baseline condition. And when we say the baseline condition, these are the existing condition and possibly past trend associated with the environment in which the proposed activities to take place. Now, I'm having established uh, a means of working with the public during the, the, the public consultation phase, which also helps you design your, your, your scoping. Uh, the, the, the data, uh, basic um, uh, technical data and information obtained are, are used in designing your, your, your scoping. They are used in designing your scoping, whereby the, 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 the impact assessor now tries to define existing conditions because as an assessor, you just cannot walk into an environment uh, and start assessing without the, 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 the due consultation or collaboration or assistance of um, the public. So for you to have a proper understanding and study of your baseline condition, there is a need to, to have consulted to have discussed, to have developed an understanding with the public, uh, uh, with the public or, or those uh, uh, to be affected during your public consultation, and uh, many a times the, the for for your baseline condition, assessors will, will try to seek answers to some of the questions that would have been developed or raised during the scoping, and at times when it had to do with culture, we will we'll be looking at. What the, the, the kind of population that might be affected because, um, for, for looking at taking an example of um, the environmental component of, uh, of baseline conditions where we'll be looking at taking uh, soil samples, air quality, the, the ground surface water and uh, the biodiversity that's a, a flora and fauna but limits bringing it to applying that now to, to the culture we'll be looking at what population will be affected by this um, proposed project, are they are they concentrated or are they are or dispersed? Now, how does each population relate to the natural or environment or the built up environment? Now, uh, what the historical background of each population, the political, social, and cultural resources, institutions, or the variables as earlier discussed, the relationship between these people and these variables uh, are, are the minority. Are there, are there minority or indigenous group that will be affected? Now, do there, are there any special need? Uh, understanding the kind of cultural practice and belief or value system that characterize each group. Uh, also, uh, looking at something like uh, the major forms of expression of each group as their maybe intangible form of culture. Uh, likewise, the tangible form of culture. Now, these are what are put together as baseline condition. Uh, though not entirely, but uh, a few of what are looked at. Because after your consultation and your scoping, you'll be able to define, establish the wide range of data you will be seeking. Now, at a minimum, this kind of information uh, should be developed based on existing literature, most times, uh, or, or government documents and consultation with experts, as earlier said. Now, when we look at uh, an example of uh, say more complicated project or policies, more formal studies based on empirical evidence may be needed. And now this could include uh, uh, taking up archaeological excavations, uh, ethnogeographical surveys, uh, historical case studies, or uh, at times cultural cartography. Now these are the components that will help us define the baseline condition of uh, of of the, 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 this part of um, assessing the cultural impact of of a proposed project uh, uh, in a community. Now, the next guideline is looking at uh, impact assessment. That is identifying and defining the significant impact of this project on the various uh, variables uh, at various stages during the life of the project. Now, once the significance of cultural heritage in the project area has been uh, evaluated, uh, the next step is to assess the potential impact of the project. Uh, this also will include the extent and economic costs of any damage. Now, the assessor should rank potential impacts on heritage 
according to uh, uh, the significance of the heritage, the level of irreversibility of the impact, and um, also looking at the extent of potential damage. Uh, it also, it will also include assessment of both direct impact associated with the with the, the destruction or distortion, and also maybe during the direct impact and indirect impact that will occur during and after such projects. Now, um, it also goes further uh, to also look at some of the criteria uh, that can be used for selecting significant impacts, uh, looking at uh, uh, bringing in now the concept of uh, the environmental impact assessment, uh, looking at the probability that an event will occur, looking at the number of people, including indigenous population that will be affected, uh, looking at uh, the duration of potential impacts, uh, also looking at the value of benefits and costs to affected group, uh, also likely the extent that the impact is, is reversible or can be mitigated, uh, uh, also the, the likelihood of subsequent impacts and uh, at times controversy or uncertainty over uh, probable uh, effects. Now, once the impact have been, have been identified and defined and properly assessed, the next is to uh, analyze alternatives. Uh, when we say analyzing alternatives, uh, it's important because the most important uh, single strategy that can enhance um, heritage protection is complete avoidance as uh, uh, looking at site avoidance. That is uh, looking at redirecting activities so that uh, they do not endanger a site. Uh, this is particularly relevant in, uh, in planning uh, projects like uh, dams, like uh, large scale irrigation or drainage projects, uh, urban, uh, looking at urban infrastructure like road construction or housing construction. Now, if, if, if the sites cannot be avoided, uh, then the assessor should consider uh, designing and constructing a workable alternative for the project, uh, as well as designing um, alternative methods and approaches for protecting and mitigation. Now, the, the, the alternative should be ranked according to effectiveness, costs, difficulty, length of time required for its implementation, and monitoring needs. As we said, the alternative must be a workable alternative. Now, decisions also uh, should be made by weighing these rankings against the cultural significance and economic value of, uh, of such sites. Because uh, in, in doing all this, one has to be realistic in, in enforcing all this. Uh, the next, which uh, it's, it's uh, the last, it's... Uh, 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 a development of an environmental management plan that completely covers uh, the cultural impact itself. And when we say environmental management plan, uh, environmental management plan, as it's known, EMP, uh, covers the design, uh, construction, uh, it covers all phases of the project life cycle, from the design, that's the planning, conception, to construction, to operation, maintenance, and the decommissioning. Now, the environmental management plan actually identifies the key environmental issues earlier raised during our uh, impact assessment after our baseline conditions. Now, these issues that are raised across the project, the EMP provides strategies and plans for managing them effectively. Now, this management plan actually consists of all mitigation and monitoring measures for each phase of the project activities to be undertaken during the entire lifespan. Lo looking at the mitigative aspect now, uh, appropriate approaches to protect cultural heritages may range from from full site protection to extensive redesign of a project. Like we said uh, during analysis of alternatives, uh, site avoidance is the best, but where this is not feasible, uh, protection uh, and an extensive redesign of a project in order to preserve the site uh, uh, is looked at. Now, mitigation could sometimes be, uh, be, be a very complicated and resource demanding exercise 
But whether the project proponents or the planning agencies or the affected community is going to assume responsibility for the realization, standard procedures requires that the mitigation measures, the mitigation measures that is being proposed is identified, properly defined and documented in appropriate legal and administrative instrument. This is very paramount. Though the entire report, the entire AIA reports, uh, the entire cultural impact assessment has legal backings. And that is where we had earlier identified the fact that we need to identify and examine all policy and legal or uh, regulatory framework that governs, that uh, protects the site. Now, it is imperative also at this point that all mitigative measures that have been constructed and have been designed must be documented appropriately in legal and administrative instruments so as to forestall or mitigate the issue of litigation in the nearest future. Now, we are, we are a significant site or a group of sites may be affected by a proposed project. Uh, archaeological, like archaeological or historical site management plan uh, should be prepared to specify the type of conservation actions. These are what must be contained in this document. Now, the type of conservation actions that should be taken for each of the surveyed sites. Now, for each site discussed or assigned or assessed, now each plan, each mitigative measure that is ensured, that is prepared to manage the site must be thoroughly documented. It must be clearly spread out. Now, when uh, relevant, the, the, the plan should ensure that the project includes measures to salvage, test, or conduct detailed survey. Now, all detailed work assessments must be, 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 be documented. Now, the management plan should also establish a monitoring, all management plan, all management plan designed for mitigating or enhancing these assessments or this impact that has been assessed must establish a monitoring plan, monitoring and evaluation system. And this will include a schedule that is coordinated within the overall project schedule and must be assigned with a detailed budget. It cannot be assigned or it cannot be brought in outside. It has to be encompassed in the entire project schedule so as to be assigned the budget for its actual implementation. Now, considerations uh, can be given when appropriate to, to leaving some sites, maybe uh, uh, selected, some selected site on the store to allow for the examination in future if, 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 if such sites are uh, uh, causing more, more harm, more, more issues. But it is imperative that all documented, all assessed sites must be documented with all mitigating measures, and these plans must contain all the mitigative actions and monitoring plans and must be embedded in the entire schedule of the project. Now, it is also important that uh, the uh, assessor uh, recommends detailed measures for strengthening capacity in managing and monitoring cultural heritage. Because I, uh, this uh, it's important because at the end of the day, once you finish assessing this cultural heritage uh, and not being able to come up with uh, these detailed measures, it it amounts to nothing. So it's it's important. These guidelines we've just discussed uh, that the culture, the cultural heritage of any community, once a project is to be implemented, must be critically looked at. And some of these guidelines proposed in here are, are very good uh, examples that uh, can be implemented in ensuring a smooth operation, a smooth implementation of such project is, um, is actualized. Because if, if, the, if the culture of a particular community is not uh, uh, protected, is not considered, is not looked at, uh, projects of such nature will not have social acceptance. And when a project doesn't have any form of social acceptance, uh, saying talking about social acceptance under which the cultural the culture comes in, uh, projects of such 
do not always see the light of day. Uh, it's important at this note to inform if uh, we have questions, uh, we should send them in uh, into our, our link. Uh, our, we have uh, info at richflow.com, and it's uh, imperative that, to assure us that uh, these questions, once they come in, uh, will be duly noted and uh, answered. Thank you. Uh, this will come to the end of our presentation for this morning. Thank you very much.